All right. Hello and good morning to everyone listening. Thank you for joining me for this installment of the Solutions for Rural Development series. Today we've got three wonderful speakers from around our beautiful state discussing how to leverage culture and history as economic drivers. For first time listeners, I want to let you know that this webinar series is brought to you for free by the Arizona Rural Development Council and the local First Arizona Foundation. These monthly webinars are based around rotating topics that address various issues and solutions surrounding the development process, specifically to rural areas. Now before we get started, I want to go over just a few housekeeping rules. For your audio, or that your volume is at the appropriate level. I know that sounds very simple, but sometimes just adjusting your volume will help you hear more clearly. For visual, make sure that you shut down any programs that you can or windows that you have open right now. Uh, that's some with your internet speed. If you're having severe issues, we recommend logging out of the webinar platform and logging back on the same way that you logged in. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and we will send it out approximately one week after today. For question and answer, we'll have some time after each presenter for a few clarifying questions. These are more brief questions. Um, if you have any really deep specific questions, uh, we ask that you wait until the end because uh, we'll have some time at the end of all three presentations. For your questions, we ask that you use your chat box, which is located on the right bottom of your screen. You'll see uh, some wording that says type your message. I'm typing in there right now. Just said hello. Um, so please feel free to communicate with us via your chat box. So uh, this is me, your facilitator and host, Maya. I'm the Rural Program Manager for Local First Arizona Foundation. I work statewide on implementing all of the Local First Arizona Foundation uh, programs that collaborate with the Arizona Rural Development Council, uh, specific to our unique rural and small town communities. Our goal is to build opportunity through a strong, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable economy. Our first presenter is Eric Vondi. Eric is the Preservation Incentive Program Coordinator for Arizona State Parks State Historic Preservation Office. He joined the Preservation Office in 2005 and manages several state property tax programs to support statewide historic preservation. After Eric, we have Drake Meinke. Drake is the founder of the Arizona Copper Art Museum, which opened in 2012 as an Arizona Centennial Legacy Project. According to TripAdvisor, the story of copper and Meinke's marketing catapulted the museum into the top 1% of all 3,700 plus tourist attractions in Arizona. And then our final speaker for today is JJ Lamb. JJ is the executive director and founding member of the Vale Preservation Society. Her focus is finding ways to connect community through local history and heritage. Today, we hope you will take away strategies to affordably implement heritage tourism attractions in your own community, how to navigate appropriately showcasing culture and history, and the economic and community benefits of heritage tourism. So we are going to get started with our first presenter, which is Eric. And feel hello. free to take it away. Okay, hello, everybody. So uh, my job title is Preservation Incentive Program Co Co Coordinator which as you can see is a mouthful to say even after all these years. But I usually tell people I'm a planner if that's my actual job classification. But either way, I have little directly to do with tourism. But starting about a dozen years ago, it became an interest of mine. 
and I'm in charge of the of Arizona's annual historic preservation conference. For a few years, we had a whole track devoted to heritage tourism each year. And while that was successful in that we had sessions full of people, we weren't really getting tourism professionals, but we were educating preservationists about tourism, we'll do tourism-oriented stuff, and would like to excuse me do some more. Uh, our conference, by the way, is in Prescott this, in 2019. So if anybody's interested in presenting on heritage tourism, let me know. Um, but back then, I had kind of categorized rural tourism and heritage tourism into two distinct categories, at least as it applied to Arizona, which was basically theme towns and art towns. And theme towns are places like Tombstone and Salignan, places that focused on their history or an aspect of their history to attract tourists. And art towns were more of places like Disney and Jerome, places that attracted a lot of artists. And you know, obviously, that doesn't cover everybody, but that has two general categories was how I was thinking about things, rightly or wrongly. And back then, when I think about rural tourism and that, I would wonder things like, can Superior start a first Friday and attract enough East Valley residents to make it work? Or Holbrook has a street and a bar called Bucket of Blood, and why isn't that being that turned into a major attraction? But as the years have progressed, those categories have broken down. Cottonwood's one very, very obvious example where they become a wine tasting town. And uh, but other things have started to change, and I'll, I'll get to that in a little bit. But first, I wanted to talk a bit more about what SHPO does. Uh, the State Historic Preservation was, was created in was created in 1966 as part of the National Historic Preservation Act. We serve as the state arm of the Federal Preservation Program. We're a state agency repre representing the state in a federal program. Every state and territory has a SHPO. There's 59 of them total. And here in Arizona, we're housed within Arizona State Parks. The National Historic Preservation Act of 1966 was preceded by a period of conflict in the 50s and early 60s. Urban renewal and the increase in transportation-related development brought by suburbanization caused the demolition of the historic core of many cities, including New York City. The demolition of Penn Station in particular drew much media attention and galvanized several vociferous figures in the into the preservation movement, including urbanist Jane Jacobs, who's pictured up here in the upper left, and journalist and art critic Ada Louise Huxtable. The division of vibrant neighborhoods by interstate clover leaves and freeways also caused much consternation amongst neighborhood activists and social justice champions. So in 1966, President Johnson passed not only the National Historic Preservation Act, which set up the preservation program nationally, but also um, the Department of Transportation Act, which provided for intensive review of transportation projects constructed with federal dollars for impacts to historic properties. A large portion of what we do is focused on downtowns, be it downtown Phoenix or Tucson or Kingman, Casa Grande, Nogales, or Bisbee. It flourishes in areas of towns developed before the era of big box stores and chain store architecture. Now, in the past few years, we've come full circle. While the Preservation Act was created in part due to the flight to the suburbs, people are now returning to the older neighborhoods, whether they be in central Phoenix or old town Cottonwood. Preservation flourishes in places that strive to be someplace rather than any place. It's in these places, too, that new businesses often flourish. Old commercial neighborhoods are often incubator spaces for entrepreneurs. And recent studies have shown that millennials prefer to be in unique places, places that do not look like the anonymous suburbs where they grew up. Of course, many studies have looked at what millennials like to do and concluded that they like to ride their bikes, hike, and eat. And places can, that can accommodate those things can often attract them. And they often look for an authentic experience, but I'll leave it to you to decide if exposed ductwork and bare brick walls and restaurants are authentic or a trend. But at any rate, in the rise to adulthood, it's led to the rise of craft breweries like House of Hops and Old Town and Old Kingman Club in Kingman, the Prison Hill Brewing Company in Yuma and Relic Road in Winslow. 
My personal belief is that craft breweries are a big key to economic turnaround in rural areas. In Arizona in 2016, the economic impact of these places was just shy of a billion dollars. And I cite craft breweries not because I drink a lot of beer, because I don't, but because in an economy where fewer corporations are controlling larger and larger percentages of every economic center or sector, craft breweries have become a small business success story. For example, of course, Amazon and Walmart have forever changed the retail environment. Disney may control 40% of the films and theaters soon, assuming their merger with Fox happens. But in the world of beer, Anheuser-Busch and Miller Coors have traditionally for years controlled something like 90% of all beer production in the U.S. But within the past 10 years or so, or so, things have started to change in beer consumption while it went into decline. At the same time, craft breweries began to expand. In a decade, employment in U.S. breweries went from around 27 to 28,000 to close to 70,000 people. And in part, this has occurred because consumer tastes have changed, in part for other reasons, but in the face of an increasingly monopoly-based economy, we have a thriving industry of small businesses. The main reason I cite craft breweries is because I think it's an effective method for competing against mega corporations that can be replicated in other industries. I, though I do absolutely believe that having a craft brewery will increase visitation to your community, assuming there's a flow of people you can take them from. Ice Creek in Clifton, for example, is a perfect place for that, where, there, where you have a ready stream of potential customers from Morency up the hill or traveling along the Coronado Trail. Um, however, I don't know if it's a good idea to have a few cold ones then hop onto the Coronado Trail, but that just adds to the need to have a boutique of people who are traveling. Uh, another reason I cite breweries is because there seems to be a trend where after about a year or two of these breweries being open, I've been invited to a community to talk about preservation and economic development strategies. It's almost as if by opening a craft brewery in an older area, it passes some threshold where suddenly enough people want to see their downtowns revitalized. Oops. There we go. Uh, heritage, tourism, and preservation are closely connected. You've heard me mention the two types of, of traditional historic tourist towns in Arizona, but these two that I'm citing on this slide are uh, prominent properties in rural towns that aren't devoted to a single theme. First one, which uh, you probably all mostly know is the La Posada Hotel, uh, designed by noted Fred Harvey architect Mary Coulter, La Posada opened its doors in 1930. It served tourists coming off the railroad on the way to the Grand Canyon. By 1960, it was mostly gutted, but it still functioned as an office for the BNSF Railroad. In 1994, it was acquired by oops, back to where. Uh, 1994, it was acquired by Alan Affeld, who invested 12 million dollars in it and leveraged tax credits to rehabilitate the building back to a working hotel and restaurant. A few years ago, I was at a National Route 66 conference. One of the plenary speakers was, a, I think he was a production designer from Pixar, who was one of the Pixar team who had traveled the length of Route 66 looking for inspiration for Radiator Springs for the movie Cars. Someone in the Q&A part of it asked him what his favorite place was on Route 66, and without hesitation, he said La Posada. Oops. Not quite yet. Then the other thing that I set up here is the Yuma Territorial Prison State Historic Park. It's an example of dark tourism, one of the many niche markets under the umbrella of heritage tourism. I always recommend people visit the prison in August so they can get a real good idea of how horrible it was to be housed there, which I haven't done that, by the way, and it is awful. But uh, it dates from the Wild West days, and it's referenced in many movies like Three Times to Yuma and The Wild Bunch, and it also makes a great place to stop for an hour or two on your way to San Diego. Uh, the Curley School is a great example of an adaptive reuse project that also used federal historic tax credits. Uh, this project was sponsored by the International Snore and Desert Alliance, an organization focused on creating ecological and cultural sensitivity through cross-border initiatives. Rehabilitation of the city's beautiful school complex into the Curley School Artisan Apartments, which was a $9.2 million project in 2007 was a centerpiece project that transformed Ajo from sleepy former mining town to a vibrant arts community. Rehab of the school soon transformed to rehab at the town square and depot, and now Ajo boasts a conference center. Influx of investment into Ajo has also resulted in the rehabilitation of many of the small bungalows that ring the downtown. 
uh, heritage tourism is particularly important for rural Arizona, and historic resources play a huge part. This slide is getting a bit dated, but the research hasn't been updated since 2014. And so when accounting for multipliers, the historic parks in Arizona State Park system generate almost $20.5 million for rural counties and provide, almost, uh, provide nearly 253 jobs. Visitation to state parks has risen every year since at least 2014, so while the job numbers may not have changed much, I'm guessing the economic impact numbers are significantly higher. For instance, system-wide, which includes the recreational parks, there is a record 0.78 million people visiting Arizona state parks. These figures here, I hope you can see them clear enough, are from NPS's uh, National Park Service's fiscal year 2015 report on act of the Federal Historic Tax, which I'll talk about more in a moment. Uh, predictably, construction jobs see the highest benefit, almost 1.3 billion of the income generated and over 29,000 jobs, followed by manufacturing with 823 million and, and uh, 18,600 jobs. Now, now we come to the incentive portion for this stuff. Um, and I've left this slide blank because it's kind of bleak out there right now, and it has been since the recession. Now, prior to the recession, there were things like the Rural Tourism Enhancement Grant that was done through the Office of Tourism, which I thought was a great program for a lot of smaller projects like wayfinding marketing, interpretive signs, and acquisition and such. And for larger bricks and mortar projects, there was the historic preservation portion of the Arizona Heritage Fund, and that funded a lot of rehab buildings in rural Arizona. But those were all swept during the recession. But we do have a few things available. Most prominently, the uh, Federal Historic Tax Credit, which encourages private sector investment in the rehabilitation and reuse of historic buildings by giving a 20% income tax credit on qualified rehabilitation expenditures. Since its inception in 1976, the credit has involved more than over 41,000 completed projects. Um, oops, go back to, there it goes. Wow, go back several. Okay. Um, involved over 41,000 completed projects and generated over $120 billion of investment and over 2 million jobs nationwide. The program is run by the National Park Service via the State Historic Preservation Offices in each state. Uh, buildings must be eligible. Uh, uh, or listed on the National Register of Historic Places, and the cost of rehabilitation must exceed the value of the building minus the cost of the land. In 2015, there were almost $5 billion invested in rehabilitation of buildings certified by the National Park Service for participation in this program, resulting in nearly a billion dollars in tax credits nationwide. Now, there's a three-step process to this. Uh, part one is basically explaining why the building is eligible. Part two is basically the planned work that must meet the Secretary of Interior standards. And the third part is verifying that the work was completed by us and then to the National Park Service. Now, uh, historically, Arizona has not seen as much interest in this program as other states have. And you can see by this map, projects have been clustered in Phoenix and Tucson. Um, we do have rural projects. There's been several in Casa Grande, and there's one currently underway in Superior. Uh, that we would, and most of those preservation projects that were in Arizona, rural Arizona were from the Arizona Heritage Fund, but we're very interested in getting more rural projects into this program. So uh, we've had, uh, let's see, this is a couple of years old data, and we've had a couple of projects completed since then, but there's been 36 projects historically, only six of which have occurred outside the Phoenix and Tucson areas. Projects totaled almost $90 million and generated $15 million in tax credits and close to 1,000 jobs from this and over $150 million in taxes for the state. Uh, but we've got the Hilton Garden Inn in downtown Phoenix. That was a $40 million project, and the Cofill Lamoureux Housing Project, also in Phoenix, that uh, another $40 million project to add to these numbers, which means they're going up significantly from where they have been. Now, 
you'll see here that nationwide, Arizona is ranked 42nd in terms of overall revenue generated by participation in this program. New York comes in first with just over $600 million in revenue. And your first thought may be, well, of course, places like New York, Virginia, and Louisiana have much higher revenues than Arizona have. They're much older. But a property only needs to be 50 years old to be potentially eligible, meaning that right now we're looking at 1968, and in a couple of years we'll be looking at the 1970s, which seems inconceivable that anything from the 70s could be historic, but nevertheless, it will be considered that way. Um, Arizona was booming during those times, so there's no shortage of commercial building stock out there. The real difference between us and most states is most states have a state tax credit program that matches or mirrors the federal one. The two most recent states to adopt state programs are Wisconsin and Texas. Now, we do have a state program for income producing properties that works very differently than the federal one. Now, the federal one was working on uh, income tax, and most state programs work on income tax. The one we have works on property taxes, and what it does, it is combinable with the federal one, by the way. In fact, it's almost always done in combination with the federal one. But um, what, what it does is um, taxes improvements at 1% for a period of 10 years. So basically, an assessor would come out and appraise the site as is, and then as improvements are made through rehabilitation, they're taxed at 1%. That's sort of the icing of the cake compared to the federal historic tax credit being the cake. And this is our other program, one of the great tools that we do have, though it's not really tourism-oriented. Um, in any way, but it's an incentive program that reduces taxes for homeowners, not income producing properties, which is primarily homeowners that are listed on the National Register of Historic Places by approximately 50%. Participation is voluntary. The owner applies to the assessor's office and we certify its eligibility. They have to be listed on the National Register, have to be non income producing, meaning no rentals. But at this point, statewide, we're closing in on 8,000 properties enclosed in this program or enrolled in this program, rather. And in this picture, you'll see that there's a brand new roof back there, which the point of this photo was to show that we're not trying to turn these houses into museum pieces. We're just trying to preserve those characteristics that qualify it for listing on the National Register. And this is by far the best tool that we have for preserving, well, homes out there. The final program that we have available is the Certified Local Government Pass-Through Grant Program. SHPO is federally funded. 10% of our federal funding must be passed on to certified local governments or CLGs. CLGs are governments that have a historic preservation commission ordinance and the ability to create a zoning overlay. Uh, now, of course, creating zoning, do, actually doing zoning overlays has become much more complicated since Prop 207 passed a decade ago, but they don't actually have to have one. They just need the ability to create one. Um, so they have also gone through a process with our office and the National Park Service to become a certified local government. And it can be cities and counties. Notice that Pima County is the only county up here that has done this. These are matching grants that they have to be applied for by the CLG, meaning the city in most cases. Excuse me. And then um, lastly, to wrap things up, um, one of the main keys are some of the main keys to make it easier for people to rehab older buildings and thus use them for tourism purposes is to adopt the international existing building code. If possible, find building inspectors who are, have experience with older buildings. Streamline regulations to make it easier to start businesses. Allow people to live on second floors of old commercial buildings so they'll remain downtown after five, which will keep restaurants open later, and then attract people. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to the next presenter. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, at this time, if there are any questions from our attendees, um, any brief questions, please feel free to type them in your chat box. And if we don't get to them right now, um, or if you think of something during the next presentation, we can circle back to it during the Q&A. So uh, we will hand it over to Drake. 
Hello everyone, my name is Drake Mikey with the Copper Art Museum in Clarkdale and I'm going to be talking about the uh, history and culture as an economic driver. Uh, small towns tell real stories and I believe that most things, in my opinion, really do start in small towns. Some of the takeaways of my presentation presenter. Okay, can you hear me now? I hope. My microphone's on, my camera's on. Some of the takeaways are uh, in the museum here, we have to be very connective, uh, connective to the folks that go through, connective to the state and even the nation uh, that pulls people in and uh, they enjoy stories that are very connective in purpose. Um, we like to show our purpose of this town. Yeah, people like to know why a town is there. I want to sort of dive in and feel like they actually are in the town for a reason. Uh, be passionate and excitement, uh, excited about the presenting your story. That always helps out. Um, always get listed. What I mean by that is make sure that you're on TripAdvisor or on other social media platforms, Facebook, whatnot. And of course, tell your story the best you can. Okay, going to change the slide to two. Um, in my opinion, Arizona is perfect for small town museum development. First of all, Arizona really only has about 100, uh, 100 towns, even less than uh, the rural communities. That means you won't have a museum every five miles like you might in Ohio. Um, and our towns uh, tell unique stories as well, instead of just about an agricultural theme. We have logging stories and mining stories and geology and Old West stories, which attract millions of tourists to the state of Arizona. Arizona also attracts millions of tourists through the large and world famous uh, tourist attractions such as Grand Canyon. So there's a lot of people in Arizona already that we can, uh, those are opportunities that we can capture. Uh, we do have in small towns an availability of usable and for sale uh, properties that you can use to develop a museum if somebody wants to do so. A large uh, volunteer base, that's pretty good. We have uh, growing retirement populations. I know that for a fact around here. Our average age group in Clarkdale, Arizona is increasing and uh, that means there's more retirement folks that might have time to spend at a museum. Um, social media platforms are available, I just mentioned it, and also benefactors are retiring in Arizona as well and they may want to leave a legacy. Uh, you can look at the um, Phoenix Museum of the uh, Museum, Musical Instrument Museum. That guy uh, started in Minnesota and here he is in uh, Arizona leaving a legacy about musical instruments. Uh, small, small towns are perfect for telling the beginnings of a story. and. Uh, that way you, you could connect to those people all around the United States just by the beginnings of the story here. We do that in a museum. We do that through copper as it starts in Clarkdale, in a sense. There's many towns it starts in, but uh, Clarkdale is one of them. And of course, that goes throughout the world to everyone. Um, another important piece, I believe, in Arizona is that we're only about 100 years old. And we've had the camera since then and we can actually see our history through those photographs. It's very important. Uh, before the days of the camera, you have to have paintings and prints and other things. And here in Arizona, we can capture those, those uh, photographs, present them, showcase them to your passersby and so forth. There's also a cross-board change in museums and attendees. I believe it's very favorable to Arizona. We're seeing a, an emerging specialty museums nowadays. Uh, there are smaller museums, they tell personal stories, uh, they tell about your community. Specialty museums, um, if you look up specialty museums on websites, you'll find out that um, the Musical Instrument Museum is considered a specialty museum. Uh, the Copper Art Museum, specialty. Uh, we're breaking away from that old art museum style that was out there. Um, people are more interested in smaller stories as well. And um, you feel much more connected to a specialty museum than you will to an art museum. Um, of course, that's general art, not 
individual personal art. Museums also can be anywhere today. Uh, we're no longer reliant on huge populations from urban cities to uh, make your museum a go. You can be in a tourist community. You can be out buying nowadays. It's similar to somebody can work out of their home office today and actually uh, provide a job there and so forth. Uh, we also have new leisure travelers that are looking for other things to do in Arizona besides just the old uh, stalwarts that we have in the state. And uh, of course, using the internet and cell phones to do searching, that's a huge one. Um, reading a testimonial by those visitors when they uh, check out the cell phones, that's what they're doing online today. And um, about 50% to 60% of all visitors to the Copper Art Museum are coming from some sort of internet or cell phone search or, and so forth. Uh, participating tourists today, uh, cultural heritage tourists, uh, looking for experiential things. They're looking for excitement and not just the history, but they want to get more involved into your story. Patrons in the museum here, definitely want short stories and short visits. 30 minutes to an hour and a half, that's our big area. Uh, people like that, uh, your, your scholarly types will want more, and your guys that pass through quickly will want less, of course. Uh, strategies for affordable um, tourism attractions in your communities. Uh, I think there's some mutual ones. And that's to co-locate, if possible, with tourism centers, or be very close to those. Also, if you have a town-owned property that might be empty, uh, you could look into that as well as setting up a museum. Reuse your existing buildings in your community, absolutely a must. That is very first in my opinion. Today's specialty museum travelers do not want to see a large brand new building. They are looking for your community's buildings. It's history. Um, what went on in that town? They're not really concerned about a brand new, big, modern building, grandiose in style. Uh, grantors commonly also award funding to preservation groups for restoring buildings rather than building new. And you can also form an agreement with your town concerning grant writing. Maybe there's somebody on the town staff that's a, a professional grant writer. You can um, work with the town and maybe utilize that individual. You have to talk to your town about that. Um, and towns do do a lot of grant uh, proposals, and there might be some promise there. Um, promote yourself at regional B&Bs, boutique hotels, timeshares, and your nearest businesses. Uh, you don't have to promote too far out, um, like uh, 50 miles. That would be quite a ways away from your museum or your um, attraction. It probably wouldn't work unless you were a larger attraction. Okay, but if you're a smaller museum, a smaller attraction, work with your community, uh, work with those B&Bs, they always send folks to museums, those boutique hotels, and even those timeshares. Uh, individual strategies for your um, attraction, make sure that you get listed on all those uh, websites that are advertising uh, to tourists. Uh, Google is one of them. Uh, when you're in town, you might drive through a town and up will pop on your cell phone that uh, make sure to visit such and such. Um, invite travel writers. Uh, these are individual strategies that don't cost any money as well. Uh, travel writers, really a lot of people follow travel writers and um, we get a wonderful return every time a travel writer shows up in the town of Clarkdale or at the museum. I wouldn't join too many organizations that are very distant from your location unless you have a reciprocal agreement. Uh, it's, you might save some money there. Sometimes organizations have large fees and uh, you can save some money by not joining every organization that's possible. Uh, you, if you're looking for money, I would, in my opinion, I would write every museum, if you're a museum or attraction in the state, a letter letting them know that you're in wanting to have a capital campaign fundraising program or an expansion program. Many museums have a limit on how much they, they can uh, spend, and that might be $100, $200, or more. You might be able to um, have a great fundraising program by just asking other museums to support your museum. I've, I've been sitting here in Clarkdale for four years. 
believe it or not, nobody's written me a letter. I would be glad to support small museums throughout the state, especially in rural communities. Um, another way you can um, affordably implement uh, tourism, ask businesses to switch over on their merchant processing machines to those give back programs. Uh, sometimes they'll designate a 501c3 and a local merchant might have quite a bit of uh, funding running through their merchant machine, such as a uh, restaurant. Maybe it's a larger one, like up in Sedona, that uh, gets quite a few people through for the day. And at the end of the day, it's quite a bit of uh, money that runs through that machine. Those give back programs may be a significant, significant fundraiser uh, for you and uh, kick in every single month. I, I did that for the local Clarkdale Historical Society, and every month they had a direct deposit to their account. Um, also, find those long-term benefactors, doers, and businesses in the community that can help you out. And charge a fee. Uh, it's expected at a museum. Uh, that might help with fundraising as well, and so forth. Um, economic benefits. What's great about museums, they can't be outsourced. So they're going to be in your community. They're going to provide some real permanence. They're going to be great for social engagement, peripheral jobs, and even the common good of your community. Museums are catalysts in rural towns, uh, especially for towns that have difficulties attracting uh, businesses. They reuse older buildings. They infill those old grocery stores, um, those old school buildings, bowling alleys, and even old theaters, which are sort of empty buildings today all over the place, a museum can fit into those buildings. Uh, they can reuse them and really make them uh, purposeful once again. Uh, your ancillary businesses can flourish, especially in your historic districts with coffee shops, bakeries, and even small plate dinners. Um, again, uh, community benefits would be uh, museums preserve and also prevent the story of your place. Museum, uh, museums increase your preservation ethics of a place, so it might be a little easier with your locals. Heritage tourism uses assets already available in your community. That's important, too. Starting a museum, you need the artifacts in small communities. You may already have those there. Uh, you might want to look at collectors out there, too. It might be in your community that you can tap into, maybe just for a rotational exhibit or maybe as a permanent one. External funding uh, is more often than not available uh, from private and government entities. Uh, how to navigate properly, showcasing culture and art or history. Today, every town in Arizona should have a museum. We have exciting stories to tell. We have Western stories, connective stories. And we're open all year long. Think of northern Michigan. A lot of times those museums close for several months out of the year because we, they don't have the tourism base uh, around the area. We also, um, you want to identify your bona fide attractions to your area, especially that are true to your town's foundation. That's a connective piece. Um, those private assets in your town that you don't know about, uh, May, you might have some cars or collections out there that you can showcase. Uh, those cars can be put out for a home tour uh, if you're interested in something like that as uh, adds more vibrance to your home tour. Other attractors in your community can be tapped into. Uh, hopefully uh, you may have uh, animal parks in the area, kayaking or even hiking. Uh, you can identify a specific theme based upon all these assets in your community. You will want to build connections uh, in your museum or your attraction. Always incorporate methods uh, for sensing. You might want to have a touch, taste, or smell uh, uh, beyond just visual in your museum. Uh, you don't have to touch everything, but maybe just put one thing out where people can touch that. It's a really good motivator for children when they can touch something. That's how they learn and so forth. Uh, simplify uh, any long stories. Try to simplify them as much as possible. Two paragraphs, three sentences long each. Figure out what your customers want. That's really important, what they're looking for when they enter your place. And in the Copper Museum here, we present a little bit differently from art museums. 
we present using a treasure trove style of effect. Uh, people, when they come to a small town, they want to see it all. Uh, they want to see everything. Uh, they want to be, um, the museum should be different from other museums that you might have in your mind. Uh, folks that are travelers are not really interested in having one vase in a case. Uh, that uh, is not something people are looking for today that rather have the treasure trove style. I want to switch slides. Okay. Um, great business model. I think I talked about that one already. Let me get to the last slide. I think that's it. Are there any questions out there? Thank you, Drake. That was a wealth of knowledge. Um, yeah, if we've got questions out there, please use your chat box. Um, and we can circle back to them if we don't get to them right now. Um, and we are going to open the floor to JJ. Okay, I'm JJ Lamb, and I'm uh, the President and Executive Director for the Vail Preservation Society. And we formed in 2006, especially uh, to preserve our local heritage and the few remaining historic buildings, um, because we understood that um, that local heritage was extremely important to our community as it is to any community. Uh, vale was established in 1880 as a railroad siding when the Southern Pacific of Arizona built the main line across Arizona. And for almost all of its 138-year um, history, it was a very rural community, often with only 15 to 25 people living at the town site. And even if you'd come through Vale in 2000, you would have, um, you might have driven right through it and not realized you were driving through Vail. Uh, there was only about four buildings right there at the town site. It's always been a very scattered rural community. In 2001, we experienced um, extreme growth. And so in 2001, there were probably a little less than a thousand people living within a five mile radius of the town site. Uh, but today, there's uh, well over 12,000. So that's um, that's pretty rapid growth. And uh, what we discovered is that um, Vail, what's authentic um, about Vail, uh, what was genuine, a lot of those values that people had, those were really being erased um, by development. Because people, when that many people move into your town, uh, they're bringing their own stories. But, but without um, a real effort, the story of the place they've moved to, that disappears. And, and those authentic stories that are found in all of our small towns, they also are a very important economic driver for that town. So I'm switching slides. Um, I would recommend, if you probably have already done this, but if you haven't, um, Find, identify that thing that is uh, really unique about your community. What are some of the defining things? What's that? And then find that unique moniker that describes your community. Vale, uh, we call it the town between the tracks. And so the image that you see right now, um, I've got uh, two kind of orangish arrows pointing to the two sets of tracks. And that's where Vale's original town site was located. And then there's two yellow arrows, and those are pointing to the two historic buildings uh, that are left in Vale. And uh, the one on the right is the 1935 Shrine of Santa Rita in the desert. The one on the left is the 1908 Old Vale Store and Post Office. All of our other buildings have been lost to time and development. All starts and stops and then the, the big development push in 2001. Um, 
so we really, this is all we have left. Uh, and we've been working, we are working really hard to reestablish that historic district right now. But um, to circle back around, uh, find that phrase uh, that really describes your community and then, um, you know, make sure that's on everybody's lips. And that um, gives the residents a, a strong sense of place, but it's also a marketing tool. So Vail Preservation Society, um, we practice what we call community-driven heritage conservation or preservation. And we work very hard to engage um, people of all ages across the community. So we get um, residents working together. And we feel like when our residents work together, then they have uh, definitely more buy-in into what you're doing. They're actively uh, helping with the process. And um, so a couple of the, the photos that I have here, we have students from um, Sienega High School Construction Tech. Uh, those students are being, um, we bring on preservation trades experts to work with them, and they are rehabilitating a 1915 railroad house that was slated for demolition. And um, as Esmond Station K-8 School was being built in our community, we moved that building to the center of the school site. Uh, the whole school has a railroad theme. And the construction tech students from the local high school are doing most of the rehab work on that building. And, and it will open this October. Uh, we also have a museum club at that school. So um, we found that by engaging um, our youth, uh, we're also able to reach that, um, oh, that generation in their late 20s, 30s, early 40s. They're very busy with their careers and raising their children. So this really helps us reach all generations. Um, you can see down uh, in below, there are students from an elementary school. We're teaching them how to make adobe. In the center um, is a workshop for high school construction tech students. And they're learning to make adobe. And then on the right, uh, this was one of our uh, adobe uh, kind of emergency stabilization workshops where uh, we had a Boy Scout troop come in and help with that work. And they're working on uh, the 1908 Old Rail Store and Post Office. So we work really hard to engage the community. The other thing that we do is host uh, annual events. And for a couple of reasons. One, uh, when you bring a community together to share experiences, that builds a strong sense of place. We think that that strong sense of place um, also attracts visitors. And uh, we're creating traditions for our residents. And we're also benefiting our local businesses. So the Tis the Season event in December uh, involves decorating the community. We have two large uh, trees of lights. And, and there's a countdown. And they get turned on at the same time. We have an outdoor movie event. Um, so it's the smaller the two events. But again, it, it builds community. And um, it it makes Vail feel like a place. The Vail is an unincorporated community. And so that presents challenges and opportunities. Um, the second event that we do, a colossal fourth, that's actually a week's worth of events. We have a committee that works on that event year round. Um, so Vail does not have any municipal government that would, or parks and recreation, anything like that really that's focused on Vail uh, to, to do any of these things that um, events and, and things like that that we do. So Colossal Fourth, um, we plan events purposely along our main Arizona Main Street, as we call it Vail Connects Corridor. And so starting down in the Empire Mountains with the winery that we have, we have a vine blessing. Um, we have some events up at the Farmer's Market. Uh, there are events at Colossal Cave Mountain Park. So we plan events purposely along that Main Street corridor that, one, get our residents out to see those special places in their community if they haven't done that, and to attract 
visitors and guests. So that brings in um, revenue for our local businesses while providing, um, you know, this tradition for residents. And then I would recommend that you look at um, what are the outdoor opportunities right around um, your community. So Vail is lucky enough to be a gateway community for the Arizona Trail. And the top three pictures are taken along the Arizona Trail. And we're also stewards of one section of the trail. And down below, we're extremely lucky to have Cienega Creek Preserve in our community. And uh, that beautiful stream with perennially flowing water is just a mile and a half east of um, Rancho Del Lago, located in Vail. It's a great opportunity. So all of those um, things are, those natural resources are opportunities for your residents. And uh, they also bring in um, business. The Arizona Trail Association invests about, oh, I think, about 15% of its annual revenue uh, to support those gateway communities and improve um, trail trailheads facilities uh, for hikers. And those hikers, uh, they visit those communities. So that's, um, you know, that's another thing to look at. And then I would say, um, you know, the story of America is, is written in its small towns. And everyone has a great story, and our residents that, that okay. oh, I apologize for that. I had I got turned off. Um, so everyone has a great story. So what's yours? You know, you want to tell those stories. Um, it. Those stories are great to build a sense of place for your residents, but they are also one of the things that will attract um, visitors to your uh, hometown. So Vail has lots of great stories, even though most of our buildings were uh, bulldozed um, in the last, you know, within the last 30 years. Uh, we have great stories, and so we're working really hard to share those stories um, and say that just because you can't see them, just because you know maybe we don't have that old saloon anymore or some of those buildings, um, we have great history that happened here. So that multi-layered history that you have, that builds a sense of place for your residents, but it also makes a very interesting destination for visitors. Colossal Cave Mountain Park, um, Last year, it had uh, right about a million dollars in revenue. All of the visitors that go to Colossal Cave, um, well, maybe not all, but probably 80% of them, uh, drive right through downtown Vail. So, you know, looking at partnering, uh, finding ways to get people to linger a little longer. So your local attractions, you want to partner with them and um, find ways that you can support each other. And then you want to look at those places. Uh, and most communities are going to have many more of those special places than Vail does. Um, we've actually only got four historic buildings left. And we're very lucky that they are at the original town site. Uh, the 1935 Shrine of St. Rita in the Desert is one of those places. And it's got a great story. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, but the story of Caroline Beach who, um, with her own money, at her own initiative, um, and actually repurposing some uh, really beautiful stained glass windows from a church that had been demoed in Tucson back in 1929, built this shrine. And you know it's been one of the hubs of our communities, but it brings visitors um, from all around the world uh, because um, Caroline had been married to a Japanese scientist, Yuki Takamini, who um, was, you know, world renowned, and she built the shrine in his memory. So people come from around the world um, to see that story. And then um, our other his really historic building is our sole remaining 
uh, uh, territorial area building, and it is the 1908 Oldville store and post office. Um, we are just starting its rehabilitation, and again, we will have um, high school students working on that. We've already started training them, and it will become the Vale Heritage and Welcome Center. Public art and creating gathering points, that's another really important way that um, you can um, build a sense of place, uh, define your community, uh, and also those special places become, um, you know, a drawing point for guests. But, um, yeah, and, and we worked really hard to also engage uh, our community in the building of uh, this giant V that you see. Uh, the, our high school construction tech students built the giant V for Vail. And um, we worked with local artists. And uh, the trial murals were built um, by students fifth grade through high school. And we had community committees working on this project for oh, three or four years. So again, it's engaging community, but um, you know, creating things that are going to help define your community and define your historic core. Again, another picture of students working on that um, project. It's all that. That art installation was installed a year ago, June, and it has already become a local icon. A lot of the local sports teams from our high school, when they win a championship or something like that, they come to take their victory picture by the V. So heritage preservation, serving present and future needs. Um, when our 1908 Oldville store and post office is uh, complete, it's going to be our heritage and welcome center. So it, it's, it will certainly have historic objects in it, but it is going to serve present and future needs. Um, it'll be a gathering place. Uh, vale doesn't really have any civic space. Uh, it'll be that place where people can come to chat and visit with each other. Uh, it will be the place where Vail Connects, our Main Street program, has information about local attractions and um, local businesses. And it'll, we plan on having it be a place for our, our local artists to um, also exhibit their work. So we have lots of big plans for that building. And the Vail Connects Arizona Main Street program has been really important to us over the last um, three or four years. It has allowed us uh, to build partnerships with local businesses and attractions. It has created a structure that we can use. Vail is not incorporated. It is simply a census-designated place. So the Arizona Main Street program has been a very important um, tool for us to use as we work to um, preserve our heritage. And um, I would say community engagement. Um, keeping it real and authentic, not trying to be anyone else, that's really important. And partnerships, that's our recipe for success. And that's all I have. Those are questions. Thank you so much, JJ. All right, so we have the floor open for questions right now. Um, please feel free to use your chat box to type in if you have any questions. While we give some space for Q&A, I'd like to share a couple things that are coming up next from Local First Arizona Foundation. We have our annual Rural Policy Forum. Oh, on here it says May 8th through 10th, but it's actually August 8th through 10th. So that's coming up. Um, it's going to be held in Wickenburg, and you can get more information and or tickets for that event at azrdc.org. In September, we have the Farmer Chef Connection. Uh, that's going to be September 10th from 11 to 4. So if you are in the food industry, whether it's uh, from the 
farm realm or the industry realm, that is a great event. It's going to be held here in Phoenix. You can find more information on that at localfirstazfoundation.org. And then next month we have a pre-recorded webinar uh, called Understanding Your Opportunity Zones that has a lot of critical information for uh, funding through the Opportunity Zone. Um, there's a very short time limit on getting in uh, your community's application and on that and it's critical for rural economic development. So if that interests you, uh, the registration will be up on the website no later than this Friday, but you can keep uh, tuned into that on localfirstazfoundation.org. Um, so we have one question. Um, that question is, where can more information about certified local government pass through? Uh, so the grants can be up to uh, $20,000 and, and require a 40% match, which can be in kind. And um, they come around yearly. The amount of money available is largely dependent on how much Congress gives the SHPOs to spend. Traditionally, it's about $80,000, and we have had trouble spending that money in the past few years. Um, it can be used for, uh, actually, you're quite, oh yeah, I did say pass through, not just the certified local government program. Okay, so then uh, they, they can be used for, um, you can actually be pretty creative with them because they're, they're, they're not brick and mortar projects, but they can be used for, uh, uh, you know, brochures usually. Um, there's some weird technical stuff that, that NPS has in there, what you can and can't be do with them, but economic studies, um, national register nomination, survey and inventory. Uh, let's see, um, we have funded things like, uh, well actually one of the most creative ones we did is we, we helped fund a project in Tucson done by Preservation Green Lab to try to determine the economic impact of older areas of Tucson versus newer areas of Tucson, which is the older, smarter, better project that Preservation Green Lab did in several major cities, but in Tucson, that was their first smaller city that they had done it in, and there's a lot of interesting information in that project. So uh, does that, I hope that answers it, or if there's something more specific, let me know. How does the town of Patagonia become certified? Um, contact me because that's a longer question. You need a, you'll need, I mean, you'll need to have a preservation ordinance, a uh, commission, which should have some professional members. But being it's Patagonia, and there's probably not a handy architect who lives there. You can certainly get one from a neighboring community. So when you have architectural or archaeological questions, you can have one on call who can answer those questions. Um, Nogales and Bisbee, I think, are the two closest places to Patagonia, which I know Bisbee's not really close, uh, that are certified local governments. Um, but yeah, so commission, ordinance, and the ability to create a zoning overlay are the first things that you need. And then, of course, city support to get that to happen. All right. So um, it looks like we are good with questions. Um, so I would like to thank all of our presenters for their time. And I'd like to thank all of our listeners for also registering, showing up, um, and for your time as well, because without you all, uh, we wouldn't have these webinars. So please check out all of our upcoming events on www.localfirstazfoundation.org. And I will be with you all next month. All right, have a great day.